So welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal life. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS, the Entrepreneur Operating System. My guests come onto the show to authentically share the highs and lows of the business and how they've managed to grow their business using EOS tools and traction. Don't think that you can just do that on your own, even if you have the knowledge. I think that having someone else as a secondary to back you up in that in that business system that you're going to implement, or in this case, entrepreneurial system, mm-hmm. is important. For us, obviously, brand, and like I'm a bit biased because that's what we do, but it is also the reason for all of our success is that every time we've got into a level in brand, we've gone, how do we go again? And we've just continued to push that. And as we said, you know, over 2 million followers now and yeah. building all this crazy stuff that we do. And today's guest is really special. So we had him on the show, must be well over a year ago. And in that time, the business has grown exponentially. They've now got over 2 million followers across all of their social media channels. They've grown to $5 million after just four years and tripled in the number of staff they have in the last 12 months. He's a kid from South Auckland who has made good. And he's going to share with us how they've actually grown and tripled the number of staff from nine to 27 over the last 12 months without the wheels falling off. Please welcome Stanley Henry, who is the founder and visionary of The Attention Seeker. Welcome, Stanley. All right, welcome. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> oh, it's great. Um, so it's been a, it's been a little while, and it obviously is. a lot of things have changed in that time. So uh, I'm really keen to hear a little bit of your story in that last sort of 12 to 18 months. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, where do we start? <laughs> well, I mean, it's been a ride. It has been a ride. Yeah, yeah tell us a little bit about that ride. <laughs> yeah, look, it's. I mean, we haven't really necessarily done anything different in this time. It's just we've doubled down on what we always did. Like we we figured out a a method that worked, which was to put as much content out about us as possible and continue to grow that and continue to grow our followership and our viewership and get better at it. And that's just led to more and more people knowing who we are and more leads coming in and more business growth. And then, and just keep doubling down on that. And, yeah. and, and actually it's taught us that we should never stop doing that. And in fact, like that's what we tell our clients, just keep doing it. Like it does is it, it, it compounds over time. Yeah. That consistency is really important. Yeah. I think, yeah. So I've had the privilege of working with you, obviously, yeah. as your EOS implementer, and we've put EOS into the business, and I think that's part of the reason why the wheels haven't fallen off. But it has, 100%. but it has been a, a bit of a journey in terms of yes, you're doing more of what you do really well, that whole hedgehog concept. Mm. But you have pivoted a wee bit, right? Because you're now working with a lot more of those sort of challenger brands. So it's not mm. as a personal branding agency. Mm. I mean, I've known you since there yeah. was you, Alicia, and yeah. um, Claire. How can you get LinkedIn leads? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now we're suddenly, you know, a, a, yeah. an entire agency. So just tell us a little about that journey, like w- what happened in that time to go from being just about generating LinkedIn leads and yeah. personal brand to where you are now. I think it. Oh, quite a few years back, we realized that we didn't actually do a specific task. Like we didn't do LinkedIn leads or we didn't do content or whatever that people came to us as problems. I figured out a solution and then we figured out a way to solve for that solution uh, or actually execute on that solution. Sorry. And those problems that people are coming to us with now are just bigger. And it's not that we are necessarily any different as a business. We still like people used to came, I want LinkedIn leads. Okay. Well, this is a solution I know. I'm still very adamant that like I get people every day come to me with problems that I don't know how to solve and I, I actually can't even figure out a solution. So I send them away. But then there are people that are like, no, I'm, I'm sure we can do this. Like we know we can do this and I'll talk to the team and we can. And so that has allowed us to go, you know, we had last year in April, we had one New Zealand come to us and say, I want you to take over our social media and do community management, do all these things. And at the time, I mean, we hadn't ever done that. Like I would never done that, but Kimberly, bless her soul, like believed in us. She like knew we could do it as a social lead for one NZ. So she gave us a shot. We said we could, we didn't have any proof except for ourselves and she, but she believed in it. Uh, and then we did it. And then, so that's then just snowballed. So it isn't that we 
necessarily have evolved our service because our service has always been solutions for the problems that people have. We just have had people come to us with bigger problems or different problems. Mm. Yeah. So that, I think for us as well, those problems they come to us with, the reason they're coming to us with those problems is they because they see the solutions we're offering in our own content as well. Yeah. And that's quite easy as a marketing agency. Well, I say it's easy, but not a lot of other marketing agencies do it. It's like, just do the thing that you sell for yourself. And then people will ask you, can you do that for me? So it's going to be now. That's why I say, I talk about like doubling down on the thing that worked for us because we're a marketing agency and we make content for people, make more of it, make better stuff. Yep. And then people come to us with bigger and better problems for us to solve. Perfect. Okay. So still, it's still huge growth. No, no, which way you look at it. I, and I know that every time I sort of meet with the team on a quarterly basis, you know, you're hiring more people. Yeah. And I've just been doing a mid-management session with, yeah. you, with your mid-managers and, you know, they're looking we at hiring. We have mid-managers. Yes, I'm right. <laughs> Insanely. Yeah. But they, you know, they're, they're talking about hiring again. Mm. And so we're just, it's, it's a huge amount of growth. And so there's challenges that come with that level of growth, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. Like. Like, I don't even talk to most of the staff. Mm. I just don't have time. Like, it's not that I don't want to. I just, I don't have the time where that hasn't been the case. You know, the last 12 months, it's really started to show. Like, there are just people I won't speak to on the team. And I could be with them all day and not say a word to them, you know. And so that's a challenge because, like, as the founder and owner of a business like this, it is your baby. And then there's now parts happening in this business. Like, I just don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like, and I shouldn't need to. But, letting go. <laughs> yeah, it's going to let you go. But like, it is kind of a scary thing because you're like, oh, are they doing the thing I told the customer that we would do? But of course they are because I would know because the customer would tell me or even if they aren't doing it and there's issues, like I'll then go to their leads and be like, okay, well, what are you doing to deal with this issue? Because it is an issue, so you need to deal with it. And they're like, we're dealing with it. Like it's happening. So, you know, like no business is perfect. There's always going to be stuff that goes on that people have to fix, but I'm not even really aware of it. And that's a challenge because like, as the owner, like it is my life view. Like it's, you know, this, this business pays for my family. So you are, you get a little, oh, like this thing's going okay, blah, 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 but you have to be able to let go. And so as I have, or as we have grown, that feeling of like, shit, is everything going okay? It, it gets a lot worse, which I don't know if it's a bad thing, but it is a hard thing to deal with it's been a challenge for me to just like i'm pretty good at like delegating but i know what i've delegated now i don't even know what's being delegated you know because i've delegated a whole client and solution to a person and they've gone and done all the delegation and so i don't even know who's doing which part anymore and that's the bit that i find a bit hard because i you, you haven't actually got control yeah the only control you got is like is my lead the best person for this role and can i trust them and and if, I, if you can't, then like we always talk about, is the right person on the right seat? And if they're not, then we have to find the right person. But so it's been a real big, tough piece. It's just that disconnect with the team. And then as always cash flow, like bigger, more money, because more problems. It's like it doesn't get easier. Like you think that, oh, more revenue means that, you know, you can, you got more money, but no, you just got more bills that go along with it. And like, May, as most New Zealand business owners will know, May is a terrible month for cash flow because you got to pay double tax and all this sort of stuff. So I just paid a, you know, what was it last week? Paid a massive GST bill. And then, and so cash flow is like, it's still the thing that keeps me up at night. I know we're in a good spot of cash flow. Like it, I can see it, we track it and stuff. But um, before it was like, oh, I got like $8,000 worth of bills to pay this month. Now it's like, got $180,000 of bills to pay this month. And that's scary because as a kid from South Auckland, as you mentioned before, like, I mean, that's not normal. Yeah. You don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. Like your, your parents didn't even earn that much money in a year combined. Yeah. And you're paying it in a monthly bills. So that's sort of crazy. And then like the, you know, the wage bill, the wage bills pushing 200 K. It's like, so that sort of stuff's been real scary. I think like the actual operations and stuff i'm not so worried about like how things get done our systems our procedures i am a bit of a person who doesn't mind things not being perfect i'm okay to like break stuff all the time so i'm not so worried about that i guess some of the guys get a bit frustrated with it that things just don't work but we are out here trying to do things 
differently and breaking boundaries with the way social media and content and stuff's done. And given that there's no roadmap for that, how are you supposed to know? And so you have to break a lot of stuff. And sometimes that breaking of things like pisses people off and whatever. And it's just like, how do you, how do you just like come back from it constantly? So I'm not so worried about that. I kind of, I quite like it. Like I quite like when things break because we've learned from it. The thing I get frustrated is when things break and they continue to break. And that's when I, that's when I'll step in and say, well, I don't have to as often as more because we're a pretty decent leadership team now, but mm. you know, that's where I would step in and be like, okay, you've broken this the same way three times now. That's just stupid. Like now we're, you know, we've got to do stuff better now. Yeah. So, so I'm not really confused, like really, I guess, worried about the operations and things. It's, it's just cash flow and not getting, and, and like that decentralization of leadership and the loss of contact time with each of my team, I feel like a pretty, pretty big disconnect. But you've now got a full leadership team yeah. and you're still part obviously of that yeah. level 10 meeting with the leadership team. What, what is it on the positive side? What's it enabled you to do? Oh, it, it lets me do way less different things. I still do lots, but I do less different things. So most of my day is sales outside of the, the actual CEO stuff, which, you know, like Maybe I even saw it on one of your podcasts, maybe this podcast, someone talking about it, the idea of like, my goal is, uh, my job is uh, find really good talent to make sure we've got really good talent in the business, sell and make sure there's enough money in the bank to pay all the bills. And so that's like my core job as CEO is to do those things. And that's all I really do now. Like I, the sales is obviously always a big part. Part of sales is also con this content branding, like being the talent for our content and stuff like that to push it out. Finding good talent is a big part of my job still, even if I'm not getting, I guess the sort of entry level roles yeah. in our business, I'm still definitely out there trying to find the, the more senior roles, the account managers, the uh, strategist roles and things like that. And, and also enabling the team to help them find good talent for their roles that they're hiring for. And then, as I said, cash flow, cash flow this money in the bank. But you're also, from what I've seen, you're pretty up to the bigger ideas as well. The, the, if you, I think about the New York office, and I remember that going on to our mm. three-year plan, and mm. within three months, you're off to New York. <laughs> yeah. Um, and now you just shared with me this morning that, yeah. you know, you've got your visas yeah. and, and off you go. So has it given you that capacity, uh, brain capacity and sort of clarity to actually go off and do those bigger things that perhaps you didn't have the opportunity before? Yeah, I think so. I think what it's, I, I kind of, in my mind, those things are for me as sales. Like, that's how I think of it. it it's not in the true sense of the word sales, but like in the way I look at sales, it's, it's market growth and big you know, ideas, big, big ideas, relationships, big relationships, all that sort of stuff, which is my part of the job too. So what it's done, having the leadership team has let me have the confidence to not worry about the operations. And like, I don't worry about the operations. As I just said, like, it's not a thing I worry about anymore. I know that we can be better, but it's not the thing I'm worried about. I know we've got a strong leadership team who can take care of that. Mm -hmm. And so I have the confidence to take off to New York for six months, knowing that, you know, Nate, Elaine, Leisha, Shy, those guys, like Connor, they've got the team, they've got it all under control. Yep. My job, the best thing I can do for those guys is find more revenue and find more talent to help them serve that revenue. And then again, pay the bills. <laughs> I'm going to pay the bills. <laughs> Which, you know, having cash in the bank is also part of sales because am I quoting these jobs, right? I'm profitable. Yeah. yeah. Am I profitable? Yeah, exactly. So am I finding the right type of business for us to be able to do what we need to do? Um, but yeah, for sure. Like I, I sat with Nate about this time. Yeah. That would have been this time last year. And I said to him, okay, so we've gotten our EOS to be in New York in March or April, sorry, 2024 to go, to go over. And I said to him, why are we waiting till April? Like, can we do this in September, October? And he's like, well, and I was like, what would we need to do? And then we, we figured it out. There's some tires we had to do and some things we had to move around and some jobs and we figured it out and just did it. And so the only reason I was able to do that is because I had that leadership team where I had the confidence to be able to take off. And then we did the 10 weeks in New York. And then now, obviously, it took a lot longer to get visas and stuff than we thought, but we got it all now and we're getting back in July. But yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, at the moment, I've been talking to... Uh, we're creating partnerships with like a branding agency who does identity branding. 
um, so logos and things like that, because it's part of our EOS was to increase our, uh, the uh, capabilities of our team. So being able to have the time to like meet with like an agency like that to be like, look, we need clients come to us with positioning solutions and some of it's making new logos and things. So increase our capability by having partnerships like that. There's another digital marketing agency of a lot of things we don't do to partner with them. I wouldn't have the time or space to think about those projects if I was worried about, guys, have we got the post out for Deborah today? You know, like I just couldn't do that. No way. So yeah, it's been, it's awesome having a leadership team. And then like, even like Shy, like having someone like Shy in the team EA, like she, that sort of stuff has just made my life so much easier. It's one of the things we recommend in EOS is that you, know, you really need somebody who you can take like that stuff and manage your calendar, manage your inbox, just be your right hand person. So it's not just about an it's not just about a PA, but it's an EA. So oh, it's actually EA. running the business. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And I didn't realize how helpful they would be having the right person. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much impact she could have had for me. Like the fact that I can go eight hours back to back meetings with prospects or whatever the thing I'm doing that day, even podcasts like this, just back to back eight hours. And I get to the end of the day and typically I'd have to spend another five or six hours dealing with the day. And I, at the now, she just gives me a summary. This is what happened. This is what you said to this person. <laughs> it's yeah. even like you and I got dinner booked uh, next week, I think. Yes. And I was like, and she and like, I didn't know. She's had all the conversations with you guys. And it's just like in my calendar, you know, just things like that. where you don't have to have like the decision fatigue from all those conversations. Mm -hmm. She's like, no, I got it. I know what you're trying to achieve. I know the goals of the business. I know what your goals are. They're taken care of. And like even sales, like. My job is just to sit in the chair, solve the problem with someone. We have our AI running, an otter, and then she she does the rest. Like all the rest of the sales pipeline is done by her. And so that's allowed me to, like even this morning, I had an hour gap. And so I was able to use that hour to do research on social media, to find solutions for other problems that clients have come to us with, you know, so that we can upsell and generate more revenue that way. But Typically, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't have this team around me, especially the EA. Yeah. I think the delegate and elevate thing is, is a really great tool to kind of go, hey, what, where do I really add value? Where's my unique ability, God-given talent, whatever you want to call it? And if you can spend your time doing that, somebody else, I mean, Shay loves doing what she's oh, doing, right? So, so you may not enjoy it so much and she just loves it. It's yeah. easy. To, it's no brainer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and just does it so much faster than I would too. <laughs> yeah. Like just so much faster. Yeah. And... Also, what I love about having a proper EA, like I think investing in a good EA, it, 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 there's so many more benefits than you originally thought. Like even just the team with her understand that she is me. If yeah. I'm not in the building, he um, shies me. And so having that, like going to New York, having that presence, knowing that hey, I need this decision made, or she knows how to answer like I would answer. Mm -hmm. She's gotten to know me so quick and understand like the way I make decisions really fast. And if she doesn't know, she'll come and ask me and then she'll never have to ask that scenario again. She like gets it straight away. Which like, I've worked with like Leash and other people for so long who have never got to that stage because they're not career EAs. Yeah. It's, not their, it's, not, not their thing. it's not their thing. Yeah doesn't make Don't them GWC less. It. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like Alicia's <laughs> yeah. great at what she does, but that's not her thing. Mm -hmm. And so like working someone with, with someone like Shy, I was like, how do you do that? Like, how do you just instantly figure this stuff out that quickly, which is phenomenal. So if anyone's listening and wants to know if they should get it yet, like just trust me, if you can afford it, yeah. just get it done. It's, uh, it's been game changing for us. Beautiful. Okay, so GW said, I just realized I use an acronym, which is a terrible thing to do. So I mean, the GW is like getting it, wanting, has capacity to do it. Yep. Obviously, that is it's in her DNA. Like, yeah, that yeah. is what she does. That's yep. much where she gets it. She really wants it. She, I know she loves working with you. Yep. And she has capacity, which means she's got the right skills and tech, you know, and things. Sometimes we get mismatches, though, right? Yeah. Where people own a role and, and they just don't GW see it. Can you give an example in yeah, a business plenty. where, yeah, okay, <laughs> good. I mean, there's plenty. There's some that aren't so. Like there's some, we've had plenty of roles or people in the business who have like formed poorly in roles because they didn't get in and whatnot. But a good example, which isn't really a negative one, but has been an actually positive story is Nate. So Nate's like, like he came in, he's quite senior, obviously he's our most highly paid employee. And I mean, he's, he, he's a senior person. He, and he was sort of like, we ran it like he was too IC to me. So he's second in charge of everything. When I went away, he was sort of in charge. 
And it's not that that's not the case anymore. He's still the second most senior people in the person in the business. But he was trying to do a GM role. And he didn't, like, we when I went away to New York and he was running that role, and like, he didn't do a poor job at it, but it stressed the hell out of him. And it was not good for him mentally either. And they're just little things that, like, if I was going for a year, things would have fell through the cracks. Because it was only 10 weeks, like, we could manage through it. And then it was summer and we got through it. And then we sort of, him and I had a good chat. And I was like, you know, like, how did you think it went? And he was like, well, I probably don't want to do that again. <laughs> you know, like, I just can't do that business side of it. There's certain parts of it I'm just not good at. I'm not built for. And anyway, we worked through a lot of stuff. And recently in the last sort of six to eight weeks, we've really defined his role as head of strategy which takes him out of the business part of the business and puts him more back into actual client work rather than thinking about how the business moves forward or anything like that and what a GM would typically do. He's more focused on strategy, which is actually the way our business is going to scale to 30 million. That for our next stage of our EOS growth is getting to 30 mil. We can't get there by making TikToks. Like we have to get there purely on strategic direction. That's where the um, bigger money is, I suppose. And Nate is a genius at that stuff. And it's taken us this whole path with him to make even him realize as well as us, actually, he should just sit here and we should build a team around him to make this department successful because that'll be the reason we go from five to 30. And it's been a really interesting journey because when he's on and he does his thing right, it's phenomenal. Like you see his working, like he's so good. But then you put him in a place that he's not good at and you're like, should we let him go? I mean, we, that's obviously not a real thing, but like to, ex, to make an extreme, like it's like, you're not good at this. Like this is terrible. So it wasn't the right seat for him, but he is the right person. So we just had to find the right seat. And now, yeah, he obviously gets it. He obviously wants, he obviously has the capacity to do it as head of strategy and he's brilliant at it. So it's been a, it's like, you could look at it in some negative ways, but it's been a real positive story for us because he had, like when we were smaller and nine people, he had to do a bit of everything because mm. we're a team of nine. You got to do it. Now we're a team of 27, like he can hone in and just do his strategy piece. And it actually makes it way easier for our account managers because they're not having to carry all that burden from the beginning of the onboarding. They've got this real senior person who's taking the brunt of the onboarding yeah. off them and he's awesome at it. So yeah, it's mm. been good. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons I like EOS is we don't set anything in stone. It's always about reviewing and going what's working, yeah. what's not working. Do we change the structure? Does the structure need to, you know, how does it support our future growth, not where we are right now? Whereas there's a tendency when you have organizational charts to go, this is what we set, we set up like this. And when somebody leaves, we replace them. We actually go, really? Should we replace them or do we find something else? Yeah. 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 I think that's a hard thing. We I talked about this on a post the other day. It's quite a hard thing when I talk to businesses for them to get through their head, like, because they... It's, we, we use the analogy of, um, like this, the older uh, fish in the tree, climbing a tree analogy, right? Like you try to put someone into something, of course, they're not going to be able to do it. Like they, they were never going to be able to do that job. Like how did you get the tree, the fish to climb the tree? Like it's not what it does. And, but the default response from a lot of leaders is, ah, oh, let's just get rid of the person, find someone new. But actually recruiting is way harder than actually finding the person the right seat, you know, like. We've had um, other people in the business and one particular who we always like bring up at AOS, we've actually found her a seat now that she's dominating in, like really dominating. Like yep. everyone's really stoked to the point where like, no, it's not even, it's a non-issue. Like it's a non-issue. Like we don't even talk about it anymore. It's just like, she's doing the thing that we needed her to do and she's nailing it. And it was just us. Like it took us two years because two years <laughs> to find the right seat, but like, but it's been brilliant and she's awesome. We all love her. And now she's doing the thing that she's best at. And now we got a, we got a really productive team member, which, you know, for the last two years, it's been like, man, what are we going to do here? So I think. But we recognize, I mean, yeah. she was always shared the core values, right? So we also about right people yeah. got the core values. She always had that. Yeah. It was just that she didn't really GW see what she was doing in her, in her exactly. role. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. you're ho always hopeful you can find another role that that person can really excel in. Yeah. Which exactly. we have. Which, which we is have. Great. Yeah. yeah. This has been awesome. Okay, what's been the, I mean, apart from the cash flow and all, this, all those sort of things, what do you think has been the biggest challenge for you in the last 12 months? Biggest challenge? I mean, there's been a lot of, like, been lots of, like, little things, but I'm, like, I'm one of those guys who, like, if the place is burning down, I'm, like, 
are not really worried ever. We'll build a new one. Yeah, we'll just build a new <laughs> one. Like I'm not, yeah. I've never really been worried. I think probably my biggest challenge is um, with our clients is understanding that like they don't share that same value as me all the time. And rightly so, like it's their business on the line and whatever and their brand and I get that. But like the biggest challenge is trying to have a team that's agile enough to be able to change and try stuff or or also hold the line, hold the joke when they know it's right. Like don't just change for the sake of changing. So both those things, like having the staff who are willing to do that, but also knowing that sometimes you've got to do what's right, like what the client wants, you know, regardless. Like even though we might not necessarily think it's the right thing or we think that what we're doing is the right way to move forward and there's a bit of a steadier, slower approach or change, we, we're going to change agile, whatever, whatever it is. That's actually probably been our biggest challenge because... It's not easy. It's not easy balancing. It's the like, same with any job, I suppose. Like it's it's not easy balancing the client's expectations versus the reality of what you deliver and what you give. Like even like McDonald's, right? Like getting a burger is like this expectation versus reality idea. So for me, that's been the biggest challenge because we all like there's now 27 people on the team. We all see the world slightly differently. The way I saw the solution is going to be different to the way Nate sees it to the way you know, Elaine sees it, any of the account managers see it, the video guys, yeah, Joni, yeah. anyone. And so there's a bit of like, I've sold something to a client. The strategy team came up with a strategy. The accounts management team briefed the videographers a way. The videographers shot it a certain way. The editors edited it a certain way. The writers wrote it a certain way. But everyone has their own take on it. Yep. And then the client expected something. And... They nece don't, didn't necessarily expect the thing that any of us thought it was. They had their own version of it. So we've got now like seven different people coming off their, their own pieces apart. And then this person over here having their own expectation. That's been really hard because that's, if you don't get that right, your retention sucks. And so I think for me, the biggest challenge is like, how do we get this process more in alignment? And then before it even gets down the chain pass, myself and Nate at the strategy level, the customer knows. And that's not easy. That's been the biggest challenge for us. Like, and we still haven't solved for it. Like, it's still a thing we're working through. Like, we're currently working through, we have, like, our EOS process yep. that we do with you. And even that, we're, like, redesigning it now. Like, we're redesigning it because we realize, one, we've evolved and changed as a team. But, two, we realize that there was still a gap where the client's expectation was different to what we said. And we didn't know how better to explain it. And so we've, we've workshopped a bit and we've been trialing it on a couple new other, newer clients at the moment who don't know any different. And it's seeming to land, but I think it's going to be a challenge for a long time. I think like creative subjectivity is a hard thing to communicate really well. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I actually don't really know the answer because no. if I did, I would fix it. <laughs> I think you, you made the point. It's about processes, right? Yeah. It comes down to, it's not about having rigidity, but actually making sure that the process supports um, the boundaries that we need to set, the communication we need to have and make mm. sure we're on the same page. Yeah. Um, and that will come and, but it will change. It will yeah. change over time. It yeah. will change. Especially with the nature of our business being something that like is quite new in terms of trying to create content that can go like sort of get viewership organically. Mm -hmm. It's not an, it's the new thing. It's a new thing, you know, like for, for forever content was dictated by gatekeepers who had the broadcasting channels and could push it out. And then, you know, the radio, TV books or whatever, magazines, and then newspapers. And then it was a kind of, we went through this weird period of pay to play on Meta and all those platforms. And now we're at this point where actually you can create content that a million people can see tomorrow if you get the content right. Mm -hmm. and there just isn't really any rule books for it at the moment. And even once you think you've figured it out, you go do it for another client and it doesn't work. And you're like, why, why is this not the same thing? Like we, we know this works, but you don't really know it works. And so it's like, you're constantly having to re uh, reinvent this process. Well, I wouldn't say the process, but like the, the actual core process probably stays the same, but like some of the activities inside each step yeah. have to change and you have to realize like, Okay, just because it worked with one, why, what is it that worked? You know, you're looking at the wrong thing sometimes. So, yeah, it's good to have the process. It helps us, but like, it's just, that's probably been a big challenge for me trying to like perfect our art, I suppose. 
Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about EOS, so yeah. remiss me not to. Cool. What has been the biggest sort of thing that has changed the business from the EOS perspective? So the thing that we talked about at the beginning about the decentralizing our leadership and like me not speaking as much to people in the team, although I said that's a challenge, it's actually been the reason for our growth. And the only reason I've been able to do that is because of the structure EOS puts in. Like I don't need to be at every EOS meeting. I don't need to know everything that everyone's doing. I have the trust that people have got their things. I've got my EOS meeting, our level 10 meeting on Mondays. It all ladders back to that one. I know if the scorecard there is right and we're going through our issues, then it will filter down to mm -hmm. everything else. And I think that that meeting cadence has been, been really good. We've now this year really, it's really only been this year that we've rolled it out right down to the lower levels. You know, we weren't very good at getting it to, I mean, we're pretty bad at just getting it to the leadership level to do their one. We finally got that, but now we, you know, the, the comms management team's doing their own one now. So we're, we're another layer deep. That there, I think has been huge. It's been game changing because like we, we talked about it in the brand meeting the other day, we look back It's six weeks into the quarter. And we look back, okay, how are we going? Like, what have we done the six weeks? Cause we're like, we're not sure what we'd achieved. And then we realize, oh crap, we actually have moved the needle so far. Like all these little weekly things that issues that we talk about, when you add them all up are huge. And so all the departments are doing that. So you're actually taking off these big rocks every quarter that, you know, it could take a company two years to achieve some of the stuff. And like we're six weeks in going, oh, so we've already done the rock. Like it's already done. Like we've finished this one. And it's like, and then. I sometimes then think, oh, was the rock not big enough? I've said that at some of our EOS yeah. meetings with you. And I think it's just that they are big enough. It's just that the team's all bought into it. Like they've all bought in going, okay, I get it. Like I get why we're doing this. The reflective part of the process of looking back at what we've done gives them so much confidence to keep pushing on other things. Cause they're like, oh, we actually are taking off a lot of things here. Like we're actually progressing a lot and they can see how it helps them in their career mm -hmm. as well. Cause they're going and they're going to be able to go into other businesses who don't do this sort of thing yes. and absolutely top of it, you know? So, yeah. yeah, that's good. I mean, I was just I talked to your team obviously just before this podcast and, and certainly they all know, you know, I asked the core values, who we are, what we do, why we do it. There was just rattled off it. They all know it and they yes. all know, and they all, they all know they know how it fits into their, their departments as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and we're now taking the next level down is like, okay, how do we make sure that everybody has got something that they're focused on that moves the needle as well as business as usual. And I always say it's the 80, 20, right? 80% of our time should be spent with business as usual, measured by the scorecard, bringing the dollars in, keeping the doors open. 20% of everybody's time should be spent on what moves the needle, how do we make things better? And once you get that happening, which you're doing, yeah. as you said, all those little things, they might only be tiny little rocks, almost like yeah. pebbles, but they you know, little tiny rocks, those rocks all add up and you've got huge changes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Especially when you get a whole team buying in on it and there's 27 people mm. all taking off a rock in a quarter. It's just huge. The, where some of the departments have moved forward, like the video team is a real good example. The video team was like, maybe at the start of the year, I was saying to Connor who leads it, like something's got to change. Like they're not where we need them to be. Like your team's not pushing the boundaries. They're not growing where it's not because they're the wrong people. It's just, we haven't put them in an environment where they can do and grow Go the way they need to. Yeah. And Connor's took on board. He's like, all right, that's my rock. Like, that's what I'm going to do. He said, this team's challenges. And now like the stuff they're producing, you know, like we can't even comprehend how they did that eight, six months ago. Like mm -hmm. we would have been like, there's no way we could do that. You know, some of the stuff that the guys have pulled off for like 660, like, I mean, how would they ever have thought we could do something like that? And then they pulled the stuff off. So, and, and it's not just that they're working with bigger, you know, like how hard is it to make content for 660? They're cool. Like just make it, <laughs> but like. Actually, all of their clients, like they're finding new ways to do things every time and how to edit it differently and how to improve it better. And like, not just turning up to video shoots going, oh, I pushed the red button, you know, like yeah. they're actually directing their shoots now. It's a bit different sometimes if they go to account managers because account managers, you know, want to come and swing themselves Muscling. around. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, like they are actually like, like just before this. You know, we had Caitlin and Ollie sitting out there and Ollie was like directing Caitlin on what the video is going to be for their next Les Mills shoots and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it's like, that's what we wanted. It's ownership. It's ownership. Yeah. And so just seeing things like that, like whole departments move forward so far because they've like set their sights on a goal they want to achieve over a quarter and then they've gone after it and they buy into it and they realize that like we've, 
EOS, because of these things, has built a culture in our team of like people who want to achieve cool things so they can talk about it. Absolutely. I have to say, Connor's one of my little gold star yeah, kind of things. 100%. I mean, it's a, so normally we work with very established businesses, very established leaders, and they learn even throughout the process. But then you've got people like Connor who've yeah. never been in a leadership role. Yeah. Um, and I remember, you know, he's just embraced it. Like yeah. he's like my little EOS um, gold <laughs> gold star boy. <laughs> yeah, um, teacher's fit. Yeah, and yeah. of course he's moved roles as well. Yeah, but yeah. he's been able to take the things that he's learned and he he's really is, you know, taking, oh, yeah. taking things to the next oh, level. Connor's a little teacher's pit. Is he? He's a little shelf. <laughs> but he's brilliant. Like he... He's grown, he's grown enormously as a leader. Like he, he always had leadership potential. I wouldn't have probably ever let him come along to you if I didn't think, you know, he had something there, but he has embraced feedback like no one else does as in like, I'm pretty hard on him too. Like I won't let him up on stuff. Like I'm, I push him really hard and I don't like, I don't sugarcoat anything with him because he's the type of kid who can take it. Yeah. He's. He's been bullied his whole life. Like, really? Yeah. Like, I mean, he rides a scooter, let's be honest. But like, uh, but that's it. Like he rides a scooter. He got bullied a lot as a kid. And so me giving him feedback on how he could do something better, like doesn't bother him. He's like, give me your worst. And I've had worst from all the kids down at the skate park. Like mm. go, go to town on me, which means that you can give him a lot more and I can push him a lot further, but he takes that and he just grows with it. And then with EOS, what it's done is I, as as the leader, I don't always have time to fully explain ideas, but EOS has given him that knowledge of like how things should be structured, how he can potentially like give a staff member a scorecard or a measure to help them grow, you know, like things like systems that like I couldn't have given because I don't have the time to like plan all that out with him. And I do it, you know, it's that curse of knowledge. I just know how I do it. It's real hard to teach it. But now we've got EOS, which is a system where he can just go, oh, well, I'll do this. I'll do the 10, the, the level 10 meetings and I'll do this and I'll do that. Just I'll GWS. Measurables, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so yeah, no, he is definitely a teacher's pet. But he's well, going to go on to do huge things. He is. I mean, yeah. he's had the unusual task of being your boss for a while there as well, wasn't he? When he was head of sales. <laughs> <laughs> and he did a bloody good job at it. Did he? Like, a very good job at it. Like, he just took it on and he just, he's one of those kids who, like, because he has been, he's had it like being bullied and he's had all this sort of, I wouldn't say hardship, like he's had a pretty privileged life, but like he's been bullied and it's not easy to be bullied as a kid. He just doesn't care anymore. Like he doesn't, he doesn't take offense. He'll just, if he wants, if he, if something needs to happen, he'll just say it, you know, like we're in a meeting, like, and he'll, he'll often be the one who throws out squirrel or whatever, like pulling us all back on task. Cause like, what are we doing? We're talking shit, like get back to the point. And, just, and just for the listeners. So. Yeah. But when I work with EOS clients, they get given a set of animals. And in those animals, we've got the elephant for the elephant in the room, Elmo for enough, let's move on. The squirrels for a tangent alert. And as you know, with entrepreneurial teams, they often kind of get distracted by bright, shiny objects or, or go off on a, on a squirrel tangent alert. So yeah. the squirrel is the, what we throw at people when they exactly. are not on track. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And he's very good at like just not caring that he's telling his boss to shut up and move on. You know, which is good because that's what you, what we ask That's them. healthy. That's, that's what, a healthy environment is yeah. where there's no sort of levels of hierarchy yeah. or we can't say that because it's the boss. Exactly. Yeah. And we, we asked it of him, you know, when we put him in head of sales, we said, no, you have to keep me to account. And if you don't, you're in trouble, not me. You know, like that's what we said to him. And so he's like, well, I'm not going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble. <laughs> and so he pulled me up on stuff and it made me a better salesperson having to report to someone junior to me, I think as, mm -hmm. as well, where I had to go, he's not pulling me up because he's actually my boss. He's pulling out because like, it's the right thing to do. Cause actually stand that is your job and you said that you're going to do it. And if you don't do your part, why the hell should we all do our part? You know? So it like made me more, want to do my job better. Cause I didn't want to let him down. Cause I don't want him letting me down. Yeah. Good talk. It's actually really cool. Yeah. And I suppose it, it's also talks to the point where in smaller businesses, often you will, you will wear different hats at different mm -hmm. levels in the business and being able to say in this meeting. I'm not the boss. I'm actually the salesperson. And it's absolutely right that that head of yeah. sales should keep me accountable. Yeah. Absolutely. It was always good ones. I was on track and then he was the one who might have missed that because I'd be like, oh, gosh, what are you doing, Connor? What have you gave it? It didn't happen often. It was probably once or twice. But I didn't mind giving him that little jab. Hey, I know that you've had a, a pretty successful kind of ride and things are going really well. But has there ever been a time when you've kind of gone, this is all a bit too hard and I feel like giving it up or I don't know. 
what thoughts have you had at times? Oh, I, I reckon constantly, I think. I think that, like, I think if you don't play the contradictions, like, if you don't play the opposite sides of everything all the time, and you, like, you know, the old plan for the worst, hope for the best sort of situation, like, I'm always looking at what's worst case scenario. And because of that, there are times where you're just like, ah, oh, things aren't going good. Like, and, and, and things haven't, there's been times when things haven't gone good. Like, start of this year, we had 70K worth of retainers fall off the books in February after my wedding of all things. I come back okay. from my wedding and the first thing, and then I had 70K worth of retainers drop off because of, you know, construction industry fell out. So construction clients had to leave. Retail industry fell away. So it's <laughs> retail clients. And uh, you're staring down the barrel of like, shit, I just hired five people. That's more than like their whole salaries, more than their salaries have been wiped off the books. How do I do this? Um, and I mean, in that situation, I like, it's tough. You're stressing. You're like, shit, how are we going to do this? I'm not really sure. There's a lot of deficit you have to do, but like, because we've put in these systems, we know what we need. I had, I was able to go to the entire team and say, look, my role is to do this. I need you to not come to me if you're crap. Like you've got your own systems in place. You've got your own teams. You know, you've got your own meetings that you can do in your years and stuff. I got to focus on sales. And then I took Shy and Shy and I just like went to work and got some sales clients. done. You yeah. know, we got some more clients and we managed to have, like fill the deficit, at least to cover over the period, right? But the, I think you always go through that. Even now, we're going back to New York in July and we have to go for July for this, for a client, piece of client work. But we're looking at staying longer for six months. And at the moment, it's like, I don't know, should I be doing this? Like, should we be doing this right now? There's a lot of like thoughts in my head that is this the right move? You know, are we going to like put the business in jeopardy because of this sort of stuff? And so, and I'll have to work through that. At the moment, it's currently go, mm -hmm. but there is definitely good reasons not to go. New office, you know, like we're looking at a new office, but there's been just as many good reasons to not get a new office as there is to get one. And Though all those decisions you make constantly, sometimes, well, you only ever make the right decision actually, because you don't know what the alternative is. So there is no way to know, but I'm going to make what I'm going to make a decision on both of those. And then I have to deal with the ramifications of that decision. And that always happens. So I think like, if I go back in time through this business, there's multiple, like the even the wedding, like the wedding itself, like it's not our, my, our personal life is not separate from the business. So even that there was ramifications of what happens because of the, the wedding, there was the going to the New York, that was real tough. I was burnt out by the end of it. Like I was absolutely exhausted. I can't really remember getting through our decompression week when I got back in December and then I went to Christmas and then that was out. We had periods of like struggles a year before that when we you know i think we got up to like 13 14 at one stage dropped back down to nine which was most of last year and a lot of that was caused by like clients just like ghosting us because of again economic reasons falling away we had a period in time where we we're losing clients through some covid reasons but also that was generating some toxicity into the company because we needed to all do more to make sure we got through and people weren't. And so they caused some toxicity. So we had some like bad eggs in the team as well, who just weren't willing to play. And like, that was really tough. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, those bad things happen all the time, like it, all the time. And they're always because of some decision you made, there's going to be some fallout. There's always like a, there's never a perfect decision. There's always like some, like a constant, for every, you know, action, there's some reaction and there's always a consequence to your decisions and a lot of people like gloss over those consequences, but like they're real. Like me going to the U S in July, there will be a loss in business in New Zealand because I'm not here. And so I have to make a real, can I grow it faster in the U S than what I could have if I just stayed here? And I have to not just grow it fast. I have to grow it exponentially faster because it costs so much to be in New York, you know? So like those sorts of hardships are constant. So what keeps you motivated in that time? What, what keeps you going? Apart from the fact we're entrepreneurs and we do that anyway, but. <laughs> yeah. Apart from that, apart from the fact that I love it, even yeah. as stressful as it is that I just love it. It's like, I got a couple of things. I mean, the first one is, is clear. Like, 
So as cheesy as it might sound, like I definitely do a lot of this for her. And and the reason I do it, yeah, like the reason, like it sounds a bit cheesy, but the reason I, I say that is this was my dream, like to do, own my own business, take this risk with our lives was my dream. Because it's not easy as all entrepreneurs know. It is actually much easier just to have a paid salary job and go a career. <laughs> Way more boring. It's definitely easier. And um, so I made her give up that life to come do this. So like it would be remiss of me to just be like, oh, well, I'm not just going to try anymore. You know, I'm just not going to go like, oh, this is a bit hard. So I might just pull back. It's like, well, she gave up her whole life that she loved to come chase my dream. So yeah, of course, like I do it. Like there's bits and elements of it. You know, she's my wife and I love her and all that sort of stuff. But actually I told her to give up her life to chase my dream. So it'd be a bit of a, a bit of a dick move if I was like, oh, you know, what? I'm a bit tired. Yeah, I might just take a break. Yeah, yeah, I'm a bit <laughs> bored, you know. So I can't really do that for that reason. But then the same thing extends to the team. Like I've now like hired people in and I've said to them, I've made a promise with them that they're, this is an ongoing concern and we will continue to build this business and you'll have a job for as long as you think it's right for you. I can't just give up and like let all those people down. I made a promise with when they signed that contract that here is a business that is going to provide for you and your family. If you do your part, we'll do our part. I can't just be like, oh, you know what? My part's boring. I want to do something else. You know, it's just like a bit of a dick move. And, you know, that's a big core pillar for us is not be a dick. And that's one of those things Like the team's bigger than the individual. And just because I might not want to do something doesn't mean I could just decide that because actually the decision doesn't just affect me. It affects the whole team. So the moment and I want to pull out. Too, my clients. Oh, yeah. 100% my clients. And maybe even more so because they're the ones who paid the staff, right? And so if I'm ever going to do that, I have to do it in a non-dick way, which would be obviously to replace me well that someone else could take over or sell to the appropriate person mm -hmm. to make it happen. But that, that, like it's, for me, those outside of just the fact that I actually enjoy it, it's always the people. It's the people in it. And mine primarily starts obviously with Claire because I made that promise with her at the beginning. But then also... Yeah, to the staff and clients and, and, and like contractors and, you know, all the people mm. who work with us. The ecosystem. Okay, yeah. that's cool. I was just wondering in terms of, I work with two different types of clients, right? There's the established business that have been around for a long time and they've hit a the ceiling and just can't get past it. And then people like yourself where that you're growing really fast mm. and you got to make sure the wheels don't fall mm. off. Talking to the people like you who are in business, who are growing really quickly, what would be the three kind of top tips you would give them that you've learned in this this roller coaster journey mm. over the last kind of four years. Yeah, I definitely think some of the stuff we talked about today around like having a system to grow, mm. you know, like we're obviously using the EOS system, which is perfect for us. Having that as a system, because it's not for you as the owner. Like, of course, it gives me a lot of things. But actually, as you know, it's been way more beneficial for my team than it has been for me. Like, I understand the principles of that. But like, it's like when a dad tells his son to do something, the son doesn't listen to the dad. But as soon as the uncle comes along and says something, the, the son listens. Yeah. And that's the same principle. Like you telling my team something is, has so much more waiting than if I tell them the same thing in this sort mm -hmm. of principle. Because they're just like, oh, it's just Dan blabbering on again. But now they hear it from someone else. So don't think that you can just do that on your own, even if you have the knowledge. Yeah. I think that having someone else as a secondary to back you up in that, in that business system that you're going to implement or in this case entrepreneurial system mm -hmm. um is important yep. for us obviously brand and like i'm a bit biased because that's what we do but it is also the reason for all of our success is that every time we've got into a level in brand we've gone how do we go again and we've just continued to push that and as we said you know over two million followers now and yep. building all this crazy stuff that we do and, and the opportunities that it, it it affords us I would say double down on that. And like, there's been a quite interesting debate online on LinkedIn at the moment. I'm not sure if you've seen it with James Herman talking about some guy, a, a lecturer, like a quite a famous brand lecturer giving a speech, uh, a talk saying how none of the big brands in life, all the biggest companies do any brand marketing. And then he countered with like, are you stupid? Like literally Google, Amazon, Facebook, or other biggest advertisers in the world, like literally make up as a portion of the advertising spend there, like a significant amount like and over represent mm -hmm. and so i guess like the point of the argument was you're never too big to advertise 
you know, like you always got to continually push brand and it doesn't always need to be, it's not all about ROI. These big brands who are spending billions of dollars on brand marketing, like if they're doing and you're a $1 million business, like who do you think you are? Like Google does it. Like every, everyone knows Google, yep. yet they spend billions of dollars every year on brand marketing. How does like a million dollar accountancy firm think they can do it without it? Which is really, really interesting. So double down on brand. Yeah, I might be a little bit of an evangelist there, but it is what it is. And and then three, the when it comes to talent, is like how do you how do you attract and find the right talent and then nurture them? Like I think has been oh like this the reason we've grown so fast over the last year is because we got we started getting that right. You know, like you know, thinking about right seat, right person, GWC, all those sorts of stuff, having our values real tight, knowing how we hire people. Every time we hire someone now, the rest of the team's like, holy crap, that person's good. Like, man, they are the right person for this team. Man, they plugged a hole that we didn't have, like we didn't have someone for. And you hear it in morning briefings, like the first few weeks of any new starter is like just overbearing amount of celebratory remarks about them. Just that's the right person, you know, which has been awesome. And like we said at our last CVS meeting, like we don't have the issues. Like when these guys, the guys we're getting on are awesome. And not to say that we've hired people in the past who aren't awesome, but like they're not like the way we're hiring now, they're just top. Like they're perfect for what we need right now. Yeah. They might not be the best people in the world at what they do, but for us right now and where we're at, they're, they're being the right people. So if you can get the right talent, you can do anything. I'm just reading the EOS People book at the moment, which talks about, I think it's 82% of, of, of businesses say their biggest issue is people. And it's like, well, but once you get the right people and you've got to the point where it's almost like Nirvana for you, where you've got yeah. people coming wanting to work for you mm. and you get the choice of mm. whether or not they're right for you, that's when things become easy. And Absolutely. that comes down to, you say, having the strong values, knowing exactly what you need, making sure you know what the role is, getting the right people for the role can make a huge difference. Exactly. Yeah. Brilliant. Hey, Stan, it's been a pleasure talking to yeah. you as always. Likewise. Thank you so much for sharing. Just You're in welcome. terms of, um, you know, because obviously I work with you and you, what's your ideal client? Tell us about who, who you love to work with. Yeah. As you sort of briefly mentioned before, like challenger brands are really our thing. And so what we mean by that are just the brands that aren't necessarily sitting at the number one point in the market. They're the people who are trying to take on number one. And the vertical doesn't really bother us. Like we, we make content for humans, not content for industries. And we like brands who want to push boundaries, like who want to try stuff and understand that like the world of social media and marketing has fundamentally changed in the last sort of three or five years. And uh, if they're willing to do that, then we're willing to help them. Excellent. Mm. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for your studio too. Yeah. It's quite nice to be That's in a different good. studio yeah, for a change. Yeah. I think yeah. you guys might even need it for you if it's nice and nothing. Oh, I think I have you. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Uh, hey, look, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Cheers. See you.